Welcome back to Main Street Living. Hearing a good story is not only entertaining, it can actually change the way you think and feel. And stories speak to us in ways that data and PowerPoint slides just can't. Absolutely, Dion. And our next guest is the director of a group in Rhode Island that's working to preserve and grow the art of storytelling. Please welcome to Main Street Living, Valerie Tutson. But we're going to call her Val today because, you know, it's on Main Street Living. We're all friends here. Val, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Dion. What an honor to be here with you on Main Street. <laughs> well, we are, of course, going to ask you to tell us a story later on. But for the first things first, you're the director, obviously, Rhode Island Black Storytellers Association. That's been going strong for nearly 25 years now. How and, and why did this group get together? What a great question. You know, uh, 25 years ago, the Rhode Island Black Storytellers didn't exist, but Rhode Island was getting ready to do a project celebrating Black arts and artists in community. And there was funding available, and there were several of us who were telling stories and going to storytelling festivals all across the country. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to start the year of a celebration of Black arts and artists in community with a Black storytelling festival? I was sitting at my friend Ramona's table and we said what are we going to call ourselves and we said how about Rhode Island Black Storytellers otherwise known as Ribs and that's how we were born. <laughs> the Ribs. Rib. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> they were hungry right for some good nourishing food and stories. <laughs> that, that's, that's very much what I thought of initially but the second thing I thought about was who are your storytellers and, and, and where does this happen? Is it like a performance event or is it in schools? Well, our storytellers started uh, as a collective of, there were about five of us who were working as professional storytellers, who included Len Cabral and Ramona Bass and Rochelle Garner Coleman, Melody Thompson, Abigail Jefferson. And we were all working in schools and libraries and we expanded. So now we include educators, we include story lovers, we include teachers, you know, because people use storytelling in every walk of life. Um, and so it isn't just folks who are telling professionally, but also people who just love to hear a good story. Yeah. Well, and traditionally, in many societies, including historically African societies, use storytelling as a way to preserve history. Obviously, it's Black History Month in February. How are you using this art form to share Black history? Well, of course, you know, long before there were books, long before we had this medium that we're in right now, television uh, or broadcast, whatever it is, uh, people gathered to hear the storyteller and the storyteller had to know the history and had to know the people. So we go into schools, you know, we just did our big festival, but individually we go into the schools and we share stories. Sometimes we're doing it on Zoom because we're still in the pandemic and we do it any way that we can. We're also teaching a course this week that we call Black History Matters, where we're sharing little known black stories on Zoom so that they can be experienced either live or pre-recorded, um, you know, in the best way that we can. So, so why is storytelling so much more powerful than just telling a fact or a lesson? Ugh, facts are so boring. Do you all remember learning <laughs> history? Look, I hated history and I tell this to kids all the time because they were facts and dates and you had to memorize them and get them right or wrong. And actually, honestly, mostly in history, I didn't learn about myself. You know, it was wealthy white guys who won the war or had the money, had the power. But I loved biographies because those were the stories of real people. So, uh, and the stories of real people go, they, they, they're, they're full bodied, right? It's not just a fact for your head, but stories help your heart and your head to come together. And a lot of times when, when you experience a story, you have to sit in silence with it because it just kind of washes over your whole being and your soul and it takes you back in time. You're sitting in this moment, but you're also able to dream about the future. Okay, well, I already can't wait to hear you tell a story in a couple minutes here because you've already lulled us in here. Uh, but also something to note too, is you guys put on this annual event called Funda Fest. Is that correct pronunciation there? Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, it's close. It's actually funda, but it looks like fun. So it's a little deceptive. That's, and that's actually why we named it that, right? It's a Zulu word spoke from the Zulu people in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And it means to learn and it means to read. And in other parts of the continent, it, it also means um, to, to learn. Did I say that already? To learn, to read, to teach. That's what I'm trying to say. So uh, for, for 24 years, we thought, well, we want to have this Funda Festival. We bring Black storytellers from all walks of life, really the diaspora, right? Because we know there's no one Black story or one Black storytelling way. And we perform all over the region, um, reaching over 7,000 students in their schools and people in public places and spaces. And of course, you know, the past two years we've been virtual. So we've literally zoomed in people from Malawi and South Africa and Jamaica and the Dominican Republic and the UK, I mean, and, you know, Minnesota. <laughs> so That's it's so cool. Fun, yeah. And we tell stories. So we tell stories, we do workshops, we create places where people can share stories together as well. So that's what we do. Well, well just like Danielle, I'm excited to maybe hear <laughs> one of those stories as well. Do, do you have time to stick with us and, and tell us one of these stories? Well, sure. All right. <laughs> I'm happy well, to. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, don't go anywhere because we are going to have story time with Val Titson on the other side of the break. We will see you there. Welcome back into Main Street Living. We are here with Valerie Tutson of the Rhode Island Black Storytellers Association. And we, of course, could not let her go without hearing a story. Yeah, Valerie, would you be able to give us a, a sample or what the, what the storytellers do or share one of your favorite stories with us? Of course, Dion. Thank you both for asking me, of course. You know, I wanted to tell you um, one of the stories that I think is most important for the work that we do. It's actually related to the symbol for the National Association of Black Storytellers, which is this. This is an animal's tale carried by people who pass on traditions. And I'm gonna tell you the story of why the storyteller is considered so important in Liberia, West Africa. And this is the way I tell it. Once, a long time ago in Liberia, there was a man who was a hunter and he had a wife and they had several children and his wife was pregnant. Now, one day this man said to his wife, I'm going off into the woods and I'm going to go hunting and I don't want you to eat till I get back. And so his wife agreed and off he went. Well, all day long, the family worked to make the meal ready. But when they sat down to eat, father had not returned. Mother said he'd be back the next day, but he wasn't. And the days and nights turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months. And before a year passed, something incredible happened. Something so amazing they forgot all about father. You can probably guess what it was, right? She had the baby. A little baby boy came screaming into the world. Wah! And he was beautiful. Oh, Dion, he looked just like you. Dark chocolate skin and beautiful hair and a nice, oh, he was so cute. Everybody loved him. And everybody watched as that beautiful baby grew. They watched him crawl and watched as he learned to Google some words. And then the best day came when he walked up to his mother and asked his first question. Mama, where is my dad? -da? And his mother said, that's a good question. I don't know where your dad went. He went hunting and he didn't come back. Well, the older children heard this and they said, mother, we saw the path that father took and we will go down it and we will find father. We'll bring him back in time for dinner. So off they headed down the same path their father had taken. And they walked for a long time until they came to a place where the path was completely overgrown and when they got there, some of the children wanted to give up because that's what some people do when they encounter an obstacle. But one child said, wait, I know how to get through here. Father showed me what to do and I will show you. And this girl got down on her belly and she wiggled like a snake underneath the roots of the trees and her brothers and sisters followed her and they found themselves standing up in a clearing 
And there on the ground, they saw a pile of bones with a human skull. And all around the bones, they saw broken and rusted hunting tools. And when they looked closely, they recognized their father's hunting tools. And being smart young people, they figured those bones must be their father's bones. He must have been killed in the hunt. We better bring these bones back to mother. But they were afraid until one child said, I know how to put the bones together. Father showed me what to do. And that child put the bones together. I know how to put flesh and blood on the bones. Father showed me and I will show you. And that child put flesh and blood on the bones. I know how to make father walk, said the next child. He showed me and I will show you. And father was walking and soon they were all dancing. And then the last child said, I know how to make father speak. He showed me and I will show you. And he touched father's mouth. And father said, my children, how good of you to have come. You've brought me back from the land of the dead. Now let's go home to your mother. And so they made their way out of the woods, singing a song to let their mother know they were coming. Ago pasole, ago pasole, ago pasole, la 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 la. There was great rejoicing when mother and father saw each other and ran together and hugged and kissed and father got to meet the baby and there was more rejoicing. And then father said, now that I'm home, I'm gonna shave my head and go into the hut and stay there for four days because that was the custom when somebody came back from the land of the dead. When I come out, I want there to be a big celebration. Kill the fattest cow you can find and bring me the cow's tail. And so they did as father asked. They gave him the tail. And four days later, when that cow was ready to feed the entire village, father walked out with the most magnificent tail with beautiful beads all around it and shells. And it was so glorious that the people said, oh, can we have it? And father said, I have special plans for this. I'm going to give it to the child who was most responsible for bringing me back from the land of the dead. Can you guess who it was? If we were under a tree, maybe I'll have a guess. We don't have a ton of time. So I'll tell you what I heard. This will go to Pooley because Pooley is the one who asked the question, Mama, where is my dada? And until he did, you had forgotten about me. You'd given me up for dead and gone. So Pooley, come here. His father handed over that tail and Pooley took it and he carried it with him for the rest of his life. He always had it, even when he was old and couldn't get around too much. And every year from that time, when the village gathered for the stories, he had been told why he received that special gift. And when he was old and when the young people would come and see him outside, they would greet him and he would greet them back and they'd say, what is it? And he would tell them and they'd say, well, where did you get it? And he'd say, if you have time, I have a story. And they'd say, yes, we have time. And Pooley would tell the story of his father. And he would always finish by saying, so you see this, it reminds me and I hope it reminds you. No one is ever dead unless or until he or she is forgotten. Amazing, Valerie. Wow. <laughs> that was seven minutes right there. <laughs> you nailed it, first of all, nailed the timing, but you were just, that, like, you're such a talent, you're such a treasure. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Oh, you so are much. so welcome. It is truly one of my favorites. At I tell it all the time, but it's especially relevant when we're celebrating Black History Month. Absolutely. And then real quick, too, for like Funda Fest, is it digital? Can people come to it? Can they see it before we let you go? You know, they can see it on our Facebook page until March 1st. We're officially over, but all of our programs are there and they can, you know, sign up on our mailing list and they can get ready for next year. We are planning now for our 25th celebration. We'd love to have everyone. 
Wow. Well, congratulations, Val. Val Tutson from the Rhode Island Black Storytellers. Thank you so much. Danielle Dion, thank you. Thank you. Wow, Dion, that was a, that was amazing. And that kind of illustrates how important, you know, oral history is and just storytelling in general. And so coming up, we are going to talk about preserving uh, and protecting our history. So don't go anywhere. <laughs>